Now, uh, talking about AWS, by the way, so we have uh, Nicola. Uh, can you come on stage, please, Nicola? So, Nicola, hi, Nicola Pietro Lunger. So, uh, I, I bet you saw some uh, stuff you know <laughs> in Rachel's presentation. So, did she already say it all or? Do you have something more to say, maybe? <laughs> ah, not at the moment. Not at the moment. I want to say Okay, speak okay. <laughs> so your your talk is pretty much done, but maybe, just maybe, there is something to say about this childcare service for APIs. I am very interested to hear how that works. I've talked about APIs and uh, pregnancy in the same topic, so you are kind of carrying out from there. So, Nicola, take the stage away, and, and I hope your presentation is re there ready. Thanks for that. So, yeah, hi everyone, and uh, I'm uh, Nicola Pietrolongo, Amazon Web Services uh, Senior Solutions Architect based in London. Over 20 years of experience in shaping and uh, developing uh, innovative solutions for large enterprises. And today I'm going to talk about uh, providing a childcare service for your API. This talk is focused on uh, everything that comes uh, before the API implementation. So the design process, uh, the ideation, the experimentation, the thinking required to drive success. Everything starts up here in our brain the most powerful known computer. A human brain possesses about uh, 100 billion neurons with roughly one quadrillion connections known as uh, synapses, wiring these uh, cells together. And do you know that uh, at birth, uh, the size of an infant's brain is only 25% of an adult's brain? And incredibly, by age three, the brain of a child has grown to 90% of an adult's brain. So in the first three years, it grows a bit more than three times in size. This makes uh, the initial part of a child's life an amazing opportunity for parents and other caregivers to shape the child's growth and form healthy habits that will, life, will last a lifetime. So I can see that uh, some of you might be confused you might ask, uh, is it not supposed to be a session about API? And uh, yes, it is. I'm talking about the importance of the initial part of the API life cycle. As children can be affected by what they have experienced uh, in early life, so the destiny of your API depends on the steps you take at the beginning. You need to consider an API as a long-term project that continues to provide a strategic value in the future. In other words, uh, you need to get the foundation right. Does this mean uh, spending weeks uh, in planning before your first uh, production release? No, it doesn't. I'm suggesting uh, to think long term. And so to change your mindset, think uh, deeply and challenge your beliefs, challenge your assumptions and validate your choices. Long-term uh, thinking requires us to look beyond uh, of what seems likely or unlikely to happen, given the current state. Instead, we should keep our minds open to what is possible and allow space for uncertainty and surprise. Let's see how to make this happen. Here I'm going to uh, show a series of principles uh, you should take in uh, consideration uh, while you're architecting your API. And the API needs to be extensible, so loosely coupled, so internal structure and data flow are minimally or not affected by new or modified functionality. Your API should be also versatile, and so capable to adapt to different purposes, at least in the initial phase. This statement will be clearer later in the talk. The API also needs to be optimized. Components needs to operate at or above user expectations. The API should be long living and so provide the long-term value at scale, enable to meet changing customer needs. This is in contrast to approaching APIs as one-time project. Then the API needs to be verbose. Verbosity in IT is the ability to provide additional details to understand what a system is doing. So extensive visibility for the business as providing business and technical metrics with uh, logging and monitoring, 
but also visibility for the customers as well, for the consumers as well. Think about error handling, API consumption limits, and so on. Finally, the API needs to be easy to consume. And so built upon standards, well-documented, easy to integrate. As you can see, we can summarize uh, all those uh, principles in one word, evolve. Evolution has to grow and adapt to changes. You might uh, now ask, uh, so where we should start? What are the steps uh, to get there? And uh, you might want to start uh, gathering uh, project uh, requirements. Well, this is uh, the wrong approach as limits the API's extensibility. For instance, if you start with uh, implementation requirements as uh, let's use this technology or that specific delivery method, you're going to narrow the scope and you won't be able to meet new use cases. Instead, you should start with your customers, understand what they really want and how their needs could evolve in the future. Let me clarify the importance of uh, the scope and customer needs uh, with uh, this simple example. Let's, ima let's imagine you work for an e-commerce uh, website in Helsinki, and your task is to design an API to provide a product name and price. It looks uh, maybe easy. You wire up some data source, use your framework of choice, and you write something uh, that returns uh, this response. Name, master toaster, 3,000. Total price, 24 euros. Who knows, it might become the best birthday present this year. As you can see uh, on the left side of your screen, uh, um, the response already looks uh, a little bit strange. And uh, I've made uh, this example simple and uh, kind of bad to appreciate more what good uh, looks like. You can see at the right of the screen, uh, uh, we have a better naming convention and a better structure item name, item price, item tax. Even if uh, this uh, uh, factual fictional e-commerce website operates at national level, the structure on the right allows the business to support multiple uh, currencies in the future. So you can easily understand uh, that uh, the amount of work to produce these uh, two results is probably the same. So same effort, but completely different outcome. Let's talk in detail about the strategy and evolution. The previous example was not designed to satisfy every possible scenarios. In fact, we should probably not code for the future, but we should be open to accept the future. Let's say you need to support multiple uh, markets uh, as uh, multiple also customer needs or multiple uh, pocket uh, of uh, customers. So you start from a basic uh, value proposition so minimal requirements and MVP, extensible. And then uh, the system over time uh, will evolve and you're gonna have uh, two choices here. Continuously support uh, multiple markets at the same time or have a single system for specific markets. You can understand from this diagram that if you use uh, the horizontal strategy on the left side of your screen, you're gonna have to have uh, a couple structure can lead to a big uh, monolithic uh, architecture, causing uh, integration, deployment, or resource constrictions problem. This doesn't happen with a vertical strategy on the right, which is more lean and independent. So to make this point uh, clearer, let's see a practical example using the e-commerce uh, API uh, website uh, uh, that I showed earlier. So let's say you need to define a web uh, API for a product detail page. When you shop online, uh, you notice that uh, the same product is available in various uh, sizes, uh, colors, uh, materials, and price points. Those uh, options are called product variants. So our Master Toaster 3000 uh, product page should show a default image in high resolution and give the ability to select all other variants. In our case, the green version of the master toaster with a different price. How would you architect your API strategy for this use case? Default high resolution image, the ability to see and choose uh, other variants. You might want to have one single web API that loads 
all the variants in advance, including all high resolution images, and then show hide elements in the front end application. But a better approach is to have two APIs, a product API that returns one default item with price and thumbnails for variants, and a second API that returns specific variant information as image and price. In this way, one API can evolve independently to the other. For example, in the uh, future, you might be able to know in advance the customer preferences. You might have a recommendation engine, or the customer simply tells you that prefers the green color. So you can change the product API to deliver the preferred item instead of the default one, leaving the product variant API same as before. So how to choose what's right? How to build in the right way from uh, the beginning? And uh, the first uh, rule is to set up a framework that includes uh, four stages. Listen, learn, build, and measure. Let's see them uh, one by one in detail. When you listen to your customer, you'll be able to understand their real needs and so improve products and services. You should engage with your customer on their preferred channels, have the ability to record feedback in a structured way. You should focus on the customers as well as the problem. So answer the question as um, why they telling you that, what they try to achieve. You should leverage uh, direct feedback as uh, asking specific question to customers and uh, indirect feedback as analyzing data from log, investigating what kinds of call are being made, why and when. Learn, don't be afraid of new things. Validate what you learn against the initial assumption you have made. The best part is when you realize that your customers are using your API in a way that you didn't expect. So bringing back the product API e-commerce uh, example, one customer might want to use that uh, public facing API for its uh, comparison website. What are you gonna do about that? Are you gonna block this call or embrace them? Perhaps providing a new service. The third stage is uh, build. Break the work into multiple parts and implement them in uh, rapid cycles managing uh, late changes. And finally, measure. Measure, and again, measure from everything technical as uh, error rates, latency, requests, cache performance, and uh, so on. But most importantly, you should define and measure your key performance indicator. So you should respond to question as, uh, what is your desired outcome? Why does, the, does this outcome matter? How you are going to measure it? You can use uh, SMART criteria to evaluate uh, a KPI. So SMART in terms of uh, specific, uh, measurable, achievable, relevant, uh, time bound. Uh, sometimes the SMART uh, criteria assumes uh, other forms as uh, simple, meaningful, attainable, uh, reasonable, time sensitive. But let me clarify this uh, with an example. I'm going to give you actually some sample KPI. Let's imagine after various, uh, various internal discussions, you define one KPI as uh, to increase the customer satisfaction by 20% in the next six months. You can see that there are measures here. Increase customer satisfaction by 20% in the next six months. So how do you measure the customer satisfaction? You can ask for explicit feedback, as in survey, post-purchase feedback and reviews, or you can see how many times a customer repeated a purchase. So monitoring returning customers. And uh, as you clearly see, KPIs allow you to be focused uh, on uh, what is important and they help you prioritize uh, between tasks and even shape your backlog. Uh, in this slide, I've collected a few uh, useful metrics uh, for you to consider. And uh, on the left side, we can see API application metrics as uh, request per minute, average and uh, max latency, or even error per minute. Of course, we have also API product metrics as uh, usage growth, 
unique consumers, top consumers by usage uh, or revenue. Retention, time to fist the low award, really helpful to understand how easy it is to uh, um, use and also uh, implement uh, uh, code with your API. And of course, API calls per uh, business transaction. Version adoption, if you have uh, multiple version uh, in, during your API uh, release. And uh, again, here you can see uh, the listen, learn, build, and measure steps. And uh, you can clearly understand this is a cyclical system. You have to complete the initial cycles very fast. When you start from scratch, uh, you should prototype your API and have your potential users interact with it as if it is the actual API you are building. You don't need to guess what the customer wants with internal Q&A or use a release first and, uh, release first and uh, adjust later method. You can simply expose a mock to simulate the final behavior and uh, start collecting data. Your project, uh, of course, will uh, mature over time. And so, uh, new cases uh, um, will be opened and new opportunities, increasing uh, the customer experience and the adoption. This will allow you to have more data points and uh, you can use this data looking for trends to embrace, blockers to be removed, and behaviors that needs to be simplified. All of this to, to build a better customer-centric product. By now, you understand how it is important to experiment uh, and uh, fail fast. Since in the early stage of, uh, uh, I mean, in the early stage, the cost of failure, uh, of course, is lower. And so it's uh, critical to encompass uh, the customer needs from the beginning of your project. And uh, as a final note, uh, back to the initial uh, discussion about how are important the early stages uh, of a child's life, Kids are more likely to improve when we focus on what, uh, on reinforcing what they've done right, rather than punishing what they've done wrong. So I would like you to be focused not on failing fast, but on uh, success early. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Nicola. It has been a really great talk and I have been trying to get the audience to ask you something but I think they need more coffee <laughs> to, That's fine. to get started uh, but I, I have to say that this uh, talk is really uh, bringing to my mind is um, some of the discussions from yesterday's uh, talk so there was definitely the, the uh, uh, Finland um, or Finnish API guidelines and, and the talk that Mina gave about thinking about the KPIs on uh, APIs and, and there were also other talks that addressed this topic. And how would you say, like, what is the best way to get to the KPIs? I mean, I mean you, you told us about the SMART method, but kind of what are the good KPIs about? If you can just summarize that. Yeah, again, uh, uh, the smart methodology, I believe, is uh, pretty strong because, again, uh, points uh, joins everything together, not only the measure, but also give you kind of a time frame uh, in which you should meet this, uh, this kind of KPI that you're going to hit. So it's uh, really important. Of course, there is always a trade-off because uh, from one side, you have the customer, uh, uh, the customer needs, and for, mm -hmm. on the other side, you have the, your, your company's needs. And so there is sometimes some, some clash in there. But uh, I believe that uh, uh, involving uh, customers and uh, hearing uh, from customers, uh, again, uh, really at the early stage of uh, your prototyping, and so the product uh, life cycle really help uh, a lot. Sometimes we can mm -hmm. discover things that uh, we didn't think about. About. And so sometimes our product API can even uh, fork or, or take different uh, different routes. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, like I have been the mother of this uh, openly licensed method API of cycles, and and actually that was referenced by Emmeline Wang from <laughs> AWS uh, Marketplace yesterday too, because it it really is exactly what you were talking about, like making. Um, sure that you you have the right apis first like for the purpose so that you have the value prop right and then you have the 
kind of uh, uh, what you design is what you measure and then you also need to learn from that and i would be curious to know uh from the audience and from you nicola that how many of you in the audience and how how much do you see nicola that kind of cycle being used in the real world or have you seen it not being used i mean if, if there are any kind of uh, pitfalls that people fall into while trying to use it yeah, I mean, that's a, a great question because, again, we always uh, think that, uh, you know, we need to push our codes as fast as we can. We need to push uh, things in front of the customer, which is uh, which is uh, uh, true. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong, but uh, measure uh, an API and measure the progress. Uh, it's uh, important as to release the product uh, as well. Again, if I have a product and then I cannot measure what this product does, uh, I cannot measure my success and I cannot measure also yeah. my failures as well. So I would say there is some kind of uh, a bit of uh, a work that needs to be done, uh, kind of a foundation that you need to put in place uh, uh, and then build on top of the fu this foundation work. And I'm uh, uh, referring to metrics, uh, uh, right uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, kind of uh, environment to also embrace uh, experimentation and, uh, and uh, development. So of course, there is uh, a bit of foundation that needs to be uh, laid, uh, laid out and laid down. And, uh, and then uh, you need to to, to quickly uh, get uh, get uh, things uh, working. And one of my example was like, uh, well, uh, nothing stops you to actually even expose a mock if you know, uh, you know, yeah. the API schema. I mean, again, it might sounds crazy, but uh, again, probably at the beginning you're gonna have only one or two customers. So why don't you know push? Uh, yeah, but that, uh, that's yeah, exactly boundaries. the point. Yeah, that's exactly the point that exposing the mock and exposing the api design usually when you have like one json file or you have open api spec or something you are already able to expose a mock but a lot of times i feel that teams are afraid to do that because they think that well the design will change and you know but actually that's the first place where they can get any kind of feedback and i've seen dramatic results of cutting down project time or, or even if it's not a project but there's still usually that initial effort that is kind of project uh type of thing and and when you you give out the hey this is how we think it's going to work can you try it out then a lot of stuff is exposed uh we have thomas uh here asking that how to predict predict sla so service level agreements in early stage as we don't have metrics and they might change in the future so what about that are you well, uh, should you be yeah. afraid to set kpis first well, uh, that's also another, another actually good question, and it's uh, kind of a, 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 to be honest, it's uh, probably a, a difficult topic to unravel. I would say, well, uh, um, I, I think again, a customer experience in terms of uh, consumer experience. I'm, I'm using this term uh, uh, also to encapsulate the consumers that are consuming your API. Again, those are the first, uh, uh, the first citizen for you. And so, in terms of SLA, of course, your service needs to be uh, at the top uh, in terms of. Uh, um, availability, resiliency, yeah. and so on. And so also probably, again, uh, the choice of technology, of course, plays a role. But I, I believe also the SLA can uh, can possibly evolve over time because uh, there are uh, uh, customers, for instance, that uh, uh, realize that uh, uh, like uh, uh, they probably, again, in terms of API, probably I don't need this API to be real time. I can cache the data. I need probably batch, uh, um, uh, I, I can just uh, get uh, data out in batches or I can even uh, be happy to get some stale data so I don't need to, yeah. to you know to over engineering my API and so perhaps for some customers even uh, okay to receive the data with a 10 minutes uh, uh, you know not, not up to date in the last 10 minutes like, again this could be also an SLA so of course you need to have uh, probably the best uh, possible uh, um, uh, type of SLA in place in terms of availability and resiliency otherwise again uh, if it doesn't work uh, the adoption will also fail but in terms of uh, you know customer experience and what the customer is expecting this type of sla also can grow over time and feedbacks are really really helpful uh, to again uh, kind of uh, um, uh, decide which direction to go mm. yeah and, and i think that it's also that you have to probably go first with something out i mean 
basically the guess is as good as anyone's at first go what the what the actual speed of the service is going to be and and if you kind of give that right uh, expectation to um, those who are going to use it and those who are deciding the project then <laughs> you're probably just good to go and then kind of set the the right SLA at the time when you have had your pilot users. So, hey, thank you, uh, Nicola, about this presentation. I think it was really great.